Okay, my ah, there we go. The light turned green, so I know I'm I'm ready to go. Well, it's great to be here. Sorry, we're a little late. Uh, believe it or not, the chairman doesn't control international airspace, and so I'll just set it right there. Thanks. But I apologize for being late. Uh, but I'm really excited about interacting with you. I hope I hope I find that you have some really tough questions that I can pass either to the commander of AFRICOM, the sergeant major, or my wife. But uh, our primary purpose in being on this trip actually is to touch as many soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, and their families to wish you a happy holiday, frankly. In the process, of course, we, we also have the opportunity to see if you have any questions um, about you know, who we are, what we are, where we're going, why we're going there, and how much is it going to cost? Because that's kind of the, the framework in which we live uh, currently. I'll tell you, though, having just come from uh, Bahrain, interacting with the sailors on the, J the uh, John C. Stennis, who some of you probably know, we alerted to go back to CENTCOM AOR after only five months home. So they did a seven and a half month deployment, they got home Five months later, we had to send them back. I mean, it's that kind of world, bit of unpredictability in our lives. But they and their families really stepped it up. Then we went to uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Manas, lovely place. This time of year, I would avoid it almost at any cost. It was 13 degrees below zero, and you know, I start to uh, become uncomfortable at about 50. So I'm just right on the edge here today. But again, you got airmen, mostly airmen up there, uh, but also members of all the services who worked that transit center. And in a given year, these are the things that I get to see that you don't, but I'm trying to make you feel good about who you are and what you are and what you're doing. About 600,000 passengers pass through Manas in a given year, either deploying, redeploying, or, or uh, in some cases on an R&R activity. Incredible, really. And in some pretty harsh conditions, part of the year anyway. And then into Afghanistan. And I, let me tell you this, no matter what you're reading, whatever you read, make sure you read broadly. And don't, you know, don't pick out one news outlet or one newspaper or one news magazine or one internet website. Uh, because this, you know, uh, sometimes I'm afraid we don't recognize success when we see it because we're, con we're so convinced by, by one particular viewpoint or another. Afghanistan just happens to be one of the most complex places on the face of the earth. And sometimes I really do think we, we can't even recognize the good we've done. I'll give you two data points, though. And I'm not predicting, by the way, that Afghanistan will be Switzerland someday. I mean, I'd like to be able to predict that, but I, I'm afraid I can't make that prediction. But let me give you two data points beside the security side of it, which will always be, how, how many of you have served in Afghanistan? Well, you know exactly what I'm talking about then. You know, Afghanistan is going to have security problems for the remainder of my lifetime, for sure. And if you're, you know, if you're a lot younger than me, probably for the remainder of your lifetime as well. It's got a lot of complex uh, issues to work through. But let me give you two data points that don't get much airtime. One is on the issue of education. In 2002, approximately 800,000 boys were going to school in Afghanistan, zero women. Today, the number is 8 million uh, going to school, and 35% of them are women. Now, you know, that's got to make a difference over time. It's got to change the, the fabric of the society in ways that I think will be pretty difficult for anyone to reverse. Secondly is access to health care. 15% in 2002 had access to health care. The definition of which, or at least the definition that the World Health Organization uses, is you have to be within two miles walking distance to health care. In 2002, 15%, today 60%. Child mortality rates are, you know, are uh, on par with uh, most nations in the world, which is incredible given you know, where they were some years ago. Internet technology has arrived. You know, they, are, they are part of the connected world now. And again, over time, not overnight, but over time, that's going to make a difference. OK, so speaking of making a difference, you're wondering, what is, it, what is this new defense strategy? How are we going to rebalance to the Pacific? Why are we going to rebalance to the Pacific? So here's a, just a couple of thoughts, and then I'll open it up to you. 
We're actually trying to look out through 2020 and beyond, because you can be consumed, especially in Washington, D.C. You can be consumed by the issue of the day, or the issue of the week, or the issue of the month. But it's our job uh, to help everyone kind of see the opportunities, the liabilities that exist over the horizon. So we picked 2020 as our target in order to you know, shape ourselves. And when you look at 2020 and beyond, you start to notice that the, the security challenges begin to migrate into the Pacific. The economic challenges of our nation migrate into the Indo-Pacific, Indian Ocean Pacific. Demographics migrate into the Indo-Pacific. So it's pretty clear that we have, we have to rebalance. And that doesn't mean we take everybody over here and say, get on this side of the auditorium. And so ne then 10 years later, okay, everybody on this side of the auditorium, come to this side of the auditorium. This is about rebalancing our intellectual energy and where we apply it. It's about changing the way we use the, 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 the military instrument of power and, and integrate it better with the other instruments of power, economic and diplomatic. We can actually figure this out. And we're going to have to do all of that with less resources. Now, notice I didn't say with too few resources. I'm actually of the belief that the, the resources we've had over the last 10 years have in some ways discouraged us from thinking. I know it's discouraged me from thinking when I was commanding at the division level, commanding in CENTCOM, and beyond. Because we did, we were blessed, and, and rightly so, with incredible financial support over the last 10 years. But the fiscal condition of the country is changing. And so we have to change with it. You know, we have to be part of the solution. We don't have to be the solution, but we've got to be part of the solution. So we're going to have to figure out how to take this wonderful military instrument of power and its most decisive instrument, which is human capital. And I mean that's to be soldiers, families, civilians that work with us. We have to use that human capital to figure out how to influence events around the world, um, mostly through the lens of human capital. I tell you all that because AFRICOM is actually an example of how that is possible. I don't think if I asked General Ham, do you have enough of, you know, fill in the blanks. Do you have enough ISR? I know the answer to that. <laughs> do you have enough maritime support? I know the answer to that. Do you have enough aviation support? I actually know the answer to that. And do you have enough ground support? I actually know the answer to that. Enough bandwidth? I know the answer to that. So, but, you're getting it done. You know, you're, you, are, you, AFRICOM, are part of uh, an enterprise that, by it, by, that is forced to network differently, conventional, special operations, other agencies of government. You are forced, because of the limited resources we can apply here, to be creative. And by God, you're creative. And so if you wonder, you know, how does the chairman sleep at night, it's some combination of the perfect martini and the fact that I know that we can do what we need to do with the resources we'll have, because I've seen it happen. And I've seen it happen right here at AFRICOM. So we're awful proud of what you've done. It's probably, I'm a little uh, ashamed to say we, that we're coming here after about a year and four months in the job. I should have been here a lot sooner. But it gets back to what, you know, this tug of, of the urgent. So, but I am glad that we finally got here to have a brief conversation with you. I, we are awful proud of what you do. For those family members in the audience, thanks for being part of this incredible effort. Uh, and what I'd like to do at this point now is open it up for your questions. And as I said, I, I do have the uh, Sergeant Major Battaglia, who is the Senior Non-Commissioned Officer in the Armed Forces and my um, Senior Enlisted Advisor. And I have my, his his wife Lisa's here. My wife Deanie's here. And we've got the hams with us. If we can't answer that question, whatever question you ask, if we can't answer it, or at least kind of tap dance our way through it, I'll be surprised. So what, what are your questions? Everything is clear. Yeah, the first one's always the hardest one. And by the way, we'll answer a question about anything. It doesn't have to be a question about Africa, AFRICOM, or for that matter, doesn't have to, is, do I see one up top there? No? Oh, please. <laughs> How many times do you get the chairman on the hot seat? Oh, here we go. <clears throat> you know, 
While he's walking over there, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one story that I hope hasn't made its way to you. I'm, I'm afraid maybe I've intimidated you. There was a guy in, uh, I think it was in Bahrain, and we're talking about budget reductions, and he stood up and he said, you know, I'm, uh, I really want to get your insights into how you think this budget thing's going to go, and on and on. It was quite a lengthy question. And at one point he said, and, and you know, it's already, I already feel the effect in my department. And he was the NCOIC of a department of about 10 sailors. And I could see on the other side of the room all of his peers, all of the other petty officers going, oh my god. You know? So I said, well, the first thing I'll say is you really need to quit whining because the rest of your crowd over there is not very happy about this right now. So I, I, that, then it kind of quieted the audience down. I won't do that to you. There is no question that, is, uh, that I will consider whining. Well, I can't really promise you that, but I'll try. Okay, where'd that microphone go? Okay, here you are. Good afternoon, sir. Um, I'm Special Agent Mary Jones. I'm in the J2X. I'm with NCIS. Uh, my question I relates... I didn't do it. Fine, thank you. How are you? <laughs> uh, my question relates to uh, civilians that are deployed with military forces. Um, having formally worn the uniform, um, I have a great deal of respect for my military counterparts, but we now have civilians that deploy on aircraft carriers with amphibious units. They've been in Afghanistan, they've been in Iraq, and serve side by side with military folks for months and months on end. One of the biggest benefits for the military when they're in a combat zone is they do, uh, their income is not subject to federal taxes. Yeah, tax exclusion. The civilians do not enjoy that benefit. Has there been any discussion for uh, civilians that are deployed in combat zones to have that same benefit in the future? I, you know, I haven't heard it, meaning uh, it's not something in which I've been involved, but I wouldn't, I, frankly, I wouldn't expect them to involve me in it. I, I will tell you, though, look, I have been in meetings where we've talked about the fact that our civilian, our, our, our DOD civilians and others who are supporting us haven't had a pay raise, I think, in three years. Is that right? And that, that conversation is being had in earnest. But I haven't heard the conversation about the tax exclusion. Has, has anyone here? Yeah. Well, I've got a team of, um, of uh, supporters here that will write that down and see if I can find out if, if it's if it's even under discussion back there. I do take your point, by the way, that um, um, you're, you know, you're out there serving right next to us, and uh, there, we, we should be more alert to the, the issues of equity. I recall serving in Saudi Arabia with a number of civilians, and I was getting tax exclusion. They were getting some other kind of pay differential, but I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, educated enough on the issue, but I'll try to make it myself that way. What else? You, you must be doing a good job. Huh? Oh, there we go. Maybe, maybe you're not doing a good job. Lieutenant Colonel Lewis, Headquarters Commandant. Uh, this is a question I'm sure a lot of folks want to know. Are we staying in Stuttgart? And if that decision hasn't been made, when can we expect to know? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, the easy answer would be yes. <laughs> But, of course, there are questions. Look, you know, one of the things, as far the answer is yes, by the way. Uh, I, I, we, we owe a report to Congress on the analysis, the, sort of the business case uh, compared to cost that it would, you know, what it would cost us to operate out of the United States, vice what it would cost to operate out of here. That report's being formulated. At some point, it'll be presented to Congress, and then we'll enter into a discussion. But we think for operational reasons, which we'd like to believe should Unless there's a huge disparity, operational reasons should dominate. Uh, it's pretty clear that operationally, it makes greater sense to have you here in closer proximity you know, to the continent that you uh, support. Um, but your, your question you know, kind of hints at the, the issue uh, of trying to keep our budget in balance and the fact that we've got we've to look at everything we do now. Uh, from pay and compensation, which was the question related to the question back there, operations, maintenance, and training, and infrastructure. And that's why, you know, as you know, we've advocated that at some point we will probably have to ask the Congress to agree to look at another BRAC, which is when it, the conversation will really get energized. But we have to, because we have to keep the budget in balance, and the way you do that is by affecting it across the board, not in isolated pockets. 
But so the answer I can give you today with, with confidence is yes, but I wouldn't suggest to you that it won't, get, it won't come up again. What else? Yes, sir. Sir Lieutenant Colonel Jim Henshin, the AFRICOM J9. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw two large topics out there, sir, and, and see what you can do with them. Uh, first one on the impending fiscal cliff. I don't think anyone's worried about what happens on January 2nd or 3rd, but can you maybe talk to us about if, uh, if, if Congress doesn't come to a solution that's acceptable, what, is, what do the weeks and months ahead look like? If you can give us some ideas of what we might see on the ground, not just here at AFRICOM, but across the yeah. military and really across the government. Sure. And the second one, sir, um, also, if you could throw a little more, you know, your vision, uh, any specifics would be great, the shift towards the Pacific, that strategic shift, what does that look like? Okay. Those are good. <clears throat> We're getting some momentum now. Okay, fiscal cliff. It's called the fiscal cliff for a reason, you know. Um, and uh, so, we're, you know, we've, been, we've, actually, we've actually been taking a look at this for some time, we, you know, at the, at the lower staff levels, but now it's kind of migrating its way up to myself and the Secretary of Defense. So you ask what it might look like. Here, here's the challenge with sequestration. It's both the magnitude, it's another $500 billion, but it's the mechanism, and the mechanism um, means that you have to take, it was initially intended to be 8% across the board. Eight, so think about having a budget, your household budget, and having somebody take 8% of it uh, precipitously. And you have no ability to influence where it comes out of, you know, whether it's your heating bill, or your vacation plans, or your retirement, or whatever it is, it just comes out, and then you know you're left to you're left to deal with it. That's kind of where we are. Except that we've exempted. We went to the president and asked him to exempt military manpower. He had the authority in the Budget Control Act to do that, and so he did. He exempted military manpower, not civilian manpower, by the way, and that he didn't have the authority to do that. So civilian manpower is not exempted from effect. So back to the question over here, because they are related, about infrastructure. You know, where do we have buildings and bases and airfields? There's two things in the budget, therefore, that are fixed right now. There, I can't, you can't touch them. One is manpower, and the other is infrastructure. What does that leave to absorb sequestration? It leaves operations, maintenance, training, and modernization. That's it. Being a chief, I was the chief staff of the Army for a long time. And in that, in that time, I did submit one budget. And in that one budget submission, I actually realized how little, it, there's not much art. It's mostly science, to tell you the truth. And um, the science is, you know, you've got six bins in which you put money, and you try to keep it in balance. Enough infrastructure, enough manpower, enough pay and compensation, enough operations, enough training, and enough maintenance. Well, in sequestration, you, which, in the first year would be between 52 and 62 billion dollars. You, you fix manpower and you fix infrastructure, meaning fix like static, you can't touch it. And that leaves operations, maintenance, training, and modernization. So those accounts, it's not an 8% cut, it's a 20, it's a 10% cut. So some, some data points for that. Programs of record, acquisitions, procurements, the, you know, the line will, each individual line as it's currently being, being interpreted would be affected. So any particular program you're tracking from F-35 to a new carbine will be affected at about the 10% level. That's really significant. It may not sound like much, but it is. Civilian manpower, uh, the, I've read the report that uh, there would be unpaid furloughs. You know, the idea being we would have to furlough, I don't know, I don't know the number, but it's, it has to be significant. But there would be a, a, you know, there would be a number of civilian employees furloughed in an unpaid status until we could, you know, get some flexibility back into the system, which could take months. And as I understand that, unlike a government shutdown, when, when the issue is resolved, the continuing resolution, where you can actually recoup the money lost under sequestration, as I understand it, you can't. So that's a huge issue for our civilian workforce. So there's kind of two, two data points. In the middle, I would talk to you about operations and training. Well, we can't underinvest in the current operations. I mean, you can't take 10% out of Afghanistan, you know, 10% of the funding out of Afghanistan. 
we can't really change much about the way we're, we're using our fleet to establish our presence in the Gulf and the Pacific. You can't really do much about the aircraft that are stationed at Al-Udeed and other places, uh, Kadena, around the globe. What that means is that the operations side of it will be kind of protected, and that which sits in the homeland will be most affected in terms of maintenance and training. And so we would be forced at some point, probably, into deploying troops with less flying hours, less tank miles, less workups if you're a naval officer on the fleet. So, you know, that gets to be pretty risky. We've got, we, we pretty much have learned over the years what it takes to get ready to deploy. And that would, be de that would be degraded. And we would have to either not deploy, extend forces in theater, or we would have to find some other way to move money. It, it's, a, it's a really, I mean, like I said, that's why they call it the fiscal cliff. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that our elected leaders of both the executive and the legislative branch find a way here in the next week uh, to, uh, to de-trigger it or to push it off. And, and uh, my job is to, is to point out the impact, and the impact is, is severe. Um, to the other part of your question about the rebalance, I think that was the rebalance of the Pacific. First thing I want to say is um, it's not a pivot. That word's been used sometimes, which implies, you know, we turn our back on one AOR area of responsibility and focus on another. It'll never be that. Look, we're a global power, and I think we aspire to remain a global power. And that means we've got to have presence. We've got to be engaging partners. We've got to be visible. We've got to be you know, influencing. We've got to protect the commons everywhere. You can't just protect the maritime domain in the Pacific and spike the ball. You can't protect the, you know, the um, aviation, uh, freedom of movement in one place but not another. So it's, this is not a light switch or a pivot. It is a rebalancing. It's, you asked what it, what it will likely look like. I, one of the things I want you to kind of remember from today is last year in our strategy, and General Ham remembers this well, we talked about rebalancing from one AOR to another. We've been very dominant, resource intensive, in CENTCOM, and we do need to, over time, rebalance that commitment of resources. So that's kind of a horizontal rebalancing, if you will. This year, I'd like you to think about it, and we just had a session two weeks ago with all the combatant commanders, the service chiefs, some of those out of OSD policy who, who help us shape, the, shape things, and we're talking about vertical rebalancing. And what I mean by vertical is, how much of the force, again, this is looking out to 2018, 2020. How much of the force should we have forward deployed? How much of it should we have rotating? And how much of it should we retain in the homeland? Because it's the homeland forces, you know, at our post camp stations and naval bases, that generally provide that surge capability so when you get the future wrong and something happens that you didn't expect, you can surge to it. And that's both active guard and reserve. So last year, we rebalanced horizontally, and we kind of know what that looks like over time. This year, we're talking among ourselves really seriously about figuring out this vertical rebalancing, because what's happened over time is we've, start, we've started to keep more of the force forward, much less of it back. And when more of it's forward, it's consuming readiness, and, the, and you have less surge capacity back. And I don't think we've got it balanced right. And we got to figure that out. So last year, rebalancing horizontally. This year, figuring out how to rebalance vertically. And then I think we'll be able to be a little more articulate with you and our partners about what we got to do. All in an environment of, of, uh, of fiscal constraint because of a new fiscal environment. That is to say, less money is going to create a condition where we're going to do less. I mean, there is, some, there is some science to that. But not so much less that we won't continue to be a, a global power. We are not a declining power. We, we can figure this out. And I'll tell you, the reason I know we can figure it out is leaders. Like I said, human capital is really our decisive edge. And we just got to tap into it. What else? Yes, sir. Sir, Kevin, Dave Kemp. Uh, I'm in our J18 Resources Directorate here. Uh, some estimates put our personnel costs in the department between 45 and 50 percent of the overall DOD budget. Can you give us an update on efforts to reform the military retirement system and health care costs, and what's, 
what that's going to mean for people here in the room? Okay, good question. Uh, first of all, let me separate the two. W what we've done is we've taken a look already. Well, let, me put it, let me put it this way. We are looking now at military compensation, which really can be defined as pay, base pay, special pay, BAH, health care. Okay? Separately, we've made a commitment to look at retirement, but not as part of this initial look. That retirement will probably be done by some commission, and one of the principles of that commission's work, I'm talking retirement, will be that personnel currently serving, who've already raised their right hand and taken an oath, those will be grandfathered. So whatever we decide to do about retirement, the first thing you need to know is that the retirement plan that you signed up for will still be available to you. Now that's unless, you know, we come off the fiscal cliff and we realize that we're only halfway down and the nation goes into depression. I can't promise you anything then. But as far as we can see, and our commitment right now, which I intend to live up to, again, unless the world economy collapses, is that those, that retirement plan you currently understand will be available to you. It will likely not be available to your, to the next generation, let's call it. What we've got to do is figure out how to put in place a retirement program that is competitive enough and generous enough that it will still allow us to recruit the quality we need and retain it. And so that's why this is going to take some time. And we, we didn't, you know, we didn't want to rush into the retirement issue because it has so many implications with recruiting and retention. Okay, military pay and comp. Let me say something about uh, m manpower cost in general, though. M our manpower costs and the whole budget, the whole Department of Defense budget, are about, about 45%. It varies from service to service slightly, but when you find the mean among all services, it's about 45%. If we if, and, and climbing, healthcare especially. If we breach 50%, we will throw the system out of balance. It will mean that manpower costs are, are drawing a disproportionate and infeasible amount of the budget and, and that something will have to give. And strength, uh, modernization most notably. So we're fighting to keep those manpower costs at about where they are, but they can't stay where they are because of inflation, because of increased health care costs. All the things that society is facing on health care, we're facing internal to the military. So we are looking at uh, figuring out how we uh, make modest changes. We're not looking for hundreds of billions of dollars, but we are looking for tens of billions of dollars in, in, in compensation, re not reductions necessarily. It could be not increases. So, I'm making these numbers up, but if, you know, if we were thinking about a, uh, a pay raise of X percentage, maybe it would be half of that instead of the whole thing. If we were thinking about uh, BAH at a certain level of compensation, we might have to slow its growth. Not reduce it, but slow its growth. The issue is really slowing growth, which will feel like a reduction, frankly. I'm not going to, you know, try to you know, I'm not going to try to uh, fool anybody here. It will feel like a reduction, but fundamentally it will be a slowing of growth, not a reduction in what uh, you have in your pocket today. But you know, I got, I, you know, we're not oblivious to the challenge that poses. In fact, the Sergeant Major sits on a panel. What we did when we started down this path, and the path, we haven't come to the end of the path yet. We haven't figured it out. But when we looked at pay raises, special pays, BAH, TRICARE enrollment fees, you know, mil uh, pharmacy co-pays, we're looking at all that. And, um, and as we do, I just want to assure you, we're looking at how we can implement it um, based on earning potential. So you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make a guess here that I make more money than you. And uh, so you know, I, would, I would pay a different proportion than you would. We're trying to figure out how to do that. And we're also uh, making sure that this isn't some uh, equation that's calculated just by officers, which is why we've got the senior enlisted advisors sitting on this panel. You know, in a, in a perfect world, I'd rather not have to do this, but you know, the Budget Control Act handed us a $487 billion bill. And unless anybody here is going to make it, I could take donations probably at the end of this session. 
and we might get about mm, a 0.1 of 0.1 percent there. But um, yeah, so we got to figure it out, and, we, and manpower costs have to be part of the equation. We just got to we got to make sure we proceed cautiously. You want to add anything to that, sir, Major? I, I would, sir. I, I think um, I think what's appropriate here is, uh, is to add in, ladies and gentlemen, the humblest values. And, you know, back, going back to the retirement question, and, and it reminds me of a conversation we were having early on. And and you know, you know as well as I, when the Defense Bureau Board came out with that recommendation with regards to. Um, a 401k like retirement plan system and and you know general Dempsey was the first to jump up and, and you know just raise the flag and say stop let's uh, let's study this let's do it the right way heck we're on our fourth retirement plan for some of you all out there like like us and maybe we don't have it right yet so let's just take our time and and study it make sure that we're making a you know a, a, a very very good informed decision because while the retirement plan may be grandfathered for us and, and our current retirees. It's the, the children and grandchildren of you all that we really, you know, need to uh, need to factor in here. So, um, so while no decisions are made yet, you know, a lot of credit needs to go to uh, to this guy right here, and and uh, and that goes with all the other pay and compensation pieces as well. He really keeps us honest and on a straight and narrow when it comes to what's uh, what's the right thing to do and how do we shape this for the future of our military to meet. Join Force 2020. Thanks, Sarah Major. What else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Major Wisdom Osagado Bewekong. I'm a civil affairs officer. There you go. I'm a civil affairs officer, sir, and I work at the Fusion Center. My question is about Africa, about the problem in Africa, about Mali. You know, according to the according to the U.S. government policy, uh, we cannot deal directly with the people of Mali or with the government of Mali. Now you could see that in the northern part of Mali, the terrorist organizations they've dug in very well. I think, I think that policy, because they, they I can tell you, sir, that the sub-Saharan Africans are not that sophisticated to that extent to have an election when there's a crisis like that. Mm. So I think, uh, you know, the U.S. government should kind of a little bit, uh, uh, you know, relax that policy, maybe to deal with the, uh, the, the military directly. And you can see that, uh, you know, General Ham, General Katerham is traveling all over Africa. He's making a very good connection with the African people and with the African government. Well. First of all, let me assure you that the situation in Mali, and really North and West Africa, uh, is very, uh, it's very evident to us. We're very engaged in it, uh, both bilaterally in some cases, meaning nation to nation, uh, also with some of our European partners, and probably most importantly with some of the uh, or the regional organizations, so up in Somalia, for example, AMISOM, and, and in West Africa with ECOWAS. So that's the first thing I want you to know is that, that nothing you said there surprised me. I, I'm, you, you probably, you should take some solace from the fact that I didn't say, Mali? Where is Mali? <laughs> we know where Mali is, and we know how important it is, and we know what a tragedy it is, actually. We've had, we've had a long history, actually, of of uh, engagement with the, uh, with the armed forces of Mali. Okay, so that's number one. Secondly, though, to, to be candid with you, uh, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier about um, redefining ourselves, maintaining our global status in a new financial situation, fiscal environment, globally fiscal environment, we have had to uh, really, uh, let me use a phrase, we've had to make a ruthless determination of our national interests. You know? So what does that mean to you? What that means to you is that we've got to find ways where we have such an important national interest that we're willing to do things alone by ourselves. We've got to be pretty clear about where those are. Mali's probably not one of them, to be honest with you. Mali's probably a place where we will do everything we possibly can with partners. And, it, and when you go down that path, when you're going to work with partners, this is going to surprise you. It just takes a little longer to sort it all out and put you know, processes, policies, and frameworks in place. And we're doing that. 
And I think you'll see that over time, with partners, we'll figure out how we can help the people of Mali overcome uh, the situation in which they find themselves. But there's, you know, but, but that's one of the things that's going to come of this conversation in a new fiscal environment, is we've got to be a lot clearer about which issues on the globe are so important to our national survival, to the survival of the global economy, you know, to all the things that are truly vital national interests, our way of life, and those will do something about it by ourselves, if necessary. Others will have to be done through partners. That's just the reality of it. Thanks for that question, though. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stacy Falkenberry, sir, J39, IL. Um, you talked about um, rebalancing and reshifting our, 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 not, or shifting our focus horizontally from CENTCOM to PACOM and thinking about what's going to happen in 2020. Have, have we put any thought behind what Africa looks like in 2020 in terms of its relative importance, particularly to the economic equation, given the resources that, because of its instability, currently are not being extracted? And it, how are we positioned because those, those resources are going to become more important to our security interests, I would think, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. As oh, absolutely. Um, why we, by the way, that's why we established Africa, Frank. You know, I mean, we don't get much credit for that, by the way. You know, the, the meaning, the, you know, the, the notion was, oh, there they go again, setting up another combatant commander, uh, another combatant command. But frankly, it was, I think, uh, the vision of, of our predecessors who noted exactly what you just said and realized that when you, when you grouped UCOM and AFRICOM together, AFRICOM you know, was kind of uh, neglected in the process. So Af AFRICOM was formed. Okay. Um, we're, yes, the short answer to your question is yes. Africa has uh, importance to us in, in any number of ways, not least of which is the human tragedy that that we see there almost every day. Um, but secondly, you know, there is this, there is the, tw the world of 2020 where resources are a greater source of friction and competition than they are today. Africa certainly stands prominent in that, in that role as well. And third uh, is this emerging kind of global, let's call it a global terrorist network or a global, you know, violent extremism, whatever, you, whatever we call it, you know, the, the thread that today runs uh, fundamentally, no pun intended, from Pakistan, you know, through the Arab Peninsula, across northern Africa, and down and now into West Africa. And that network, in order, to, in order to deal with networks like that, you have to keep pressure on all parts of the network. And so what we're grappling with now, General Hamm is grappling with, with me, with Bill McRaven at SOCOM, with all of the combatant commanders are trying to come to grips with that reality that, uh, that this, let's call it, contest of wills and ideological struggle that is violent extremism is, is a decades-long endeavor. And Africa figures prominently into it. But what we don't want to do is just kind of mindlessly take the same template we used in Pakistan, the same template we used in Afghanistan, the template we used in Iraq, the template we're using in the, in the uh, Arab Peninsula, and say, okay, that's the template that makes sense in Africa. It's probably not, actually. I'm, I mean, I've found in my 38 years, templates are dangerous things. You know, there is no template you can just take from, you know, the Arab world and place it into Africa, either Northern Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we're trying to be thoughtful about how to look a little deeper, use the resources we have, uh, learn as we go to be a learning organization, and I think that it's AFRICOM that will have to be the voice of making sure that that template fits. So I, we, we are engaged in it. Uh, I wouldn't say we've got the answers yet, that's for sure. What else? Yes. Sir, my name is uh, Vaughn Anderson. I'm in the Resources Directorate. And I'm curious on whether there's anything since you've become chairman that uh, has changed your understanding or application of leadership. Let me make sure I understand the question. Since I've been chairman, the what? Since you've become chairman, uh, is there anything that uh, changed your reflections or views on leadership, how you understand the concept, how you apply it, et cetera? Well, that's a great question. Well, first of all, 
I said earlier, I want to reiterate, I, it's pretty clear to me that when, as we try to embrace change, I mean, the, the world is really changing. And it's changing, it's changing at a more rapid pace than it ever has. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things in the world that are still the same as they were you know, throughout history. I read a letter that, um, I'm not trying to avoid the question, I'm trying to think about it while I talk. Um, I read a letter that Marshall sent, George C. Marshall sent the day after Japan surrendered. He sent it to all of his commanders across the globe. And he said, we have ended the war in Europe and in the Pacific. We have to do three things. We have to discharge 5 million, mostly men, men and women, but mostly men, 5 million men from the armed forces in the next year. You talk about drawdown. He said, we have to retool the defense industrial base from a wartime footing to a peacetime footing. We, we got exactly the same problem. Well, not exactly the same problem. We got a very similar problem. And he said, now that we are both an Atlantic and a Pacific power, we have to think about how we will posture ourselves in the Pacific. I'm not making that up. So that's 1945. What I learned from that, if you want a new idea, read an old book. Um, so what kind of leaders, you know, this is the question we ask ourselves often. And, we, and, and fundamentally, we ask it um, at seminars that the combatant commanders and service chiefs and I hold. They end up being about every four months or so. And we took one staff ride up to the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest day in American history, Civil War, uh, 23,000 casualties in one day. And we went up there to talk about these issues because we wanted something to come out of the ground, you know, to help us kind of think about uh, what we want to leave behind us, because you know most of us are within, uh, you know, we're all, we're all within single-digit years, and some of us, you know, I'm one speech away from a, you know, from retirement at any given time. So, <laughs> I hope this isn't the one. But um, that's not bad, by the way. Meaning, you know, knowing that that it's really about what you can get done today is not a bad way to live, actually. So, the leaders of the uh, the, the, lead, the military leaders that we're going to uh, produce, develop, I think have a lot of enduring qualities. You know, integrity will always be an enduring quality of our military. Courage has to be an enduring quality of our military. But there are some new ones, I think. I think uh, probably innovation, the willingness to embrace change, adaptability, I think those are new. I mean, when I came in the Army in 1974, nobody really said to me, you know, you really have to be adaptable. Now, you learn to be adaptable over time. But mostly what I was expected to do as a lieutenant, a captain, probably even a major, was, here, you know, here it is, get it done. Don't do too much thinking about it now, because we don't want you to screw this up. Um, that world is no longer, that, there is, that world doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's a world that's connected 24-7, 365, wherever you happen to be. You know, our young soldiers go to basic training, and, and uh, most of our basic training locations are wireless now. And you'll find that, uh, you know, you'll find this young kid, Intel analyst, Fort Huachuca, sitting in the middle of the football field, lap, you know, cross-legged with a laptop, and he wants to be alone, but connected to the world. You know, that's, I'm 60 years old. I can't relate to that, you know, alone and connected. What, how does that, what does that mean? But that's, that's, I'm telling you, that's your kids too, right? So I think we need to leverage that curiosity, um, you know, passionate curiosity. I think we need to leverage their entrepreneurialism. Most kids today, I'll use kids as even my own kids, you know that most young men and women that graduate from college today will have four jobs by the time they're 35 years old. Once I joined the Army, I knew that was it. I was going to you know, retire at some point and, and uh, play really bad golf and drink really good beer, and uh, that was just what it was going to be. It just, once, once I reached about the eight-year point, it never occurred to me. We have, we have young men and women transitioning constantly. One of the things I'm trying to figure out is there a way to let them kind of you know, embrace that entrepreneurial spirit, let them leave the service for a couple of years and come back if they want to come back, if we can figure out a way to do that over time. So, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit, passionate curiosity, 
embrace change, don't fight it. Um, good stewards, because the resources are... You know, but a lot of the things are exactly the same. Physically fit, disciplined, integrity, courage. You know, all the things that are on the back of our dog tag. That'll always be the case. But there are some things that are new, and we're trying to figure it out, leveraging technology. And I think we're going to figure it out, actually. And I actually think, you know, we're going to be... We'll, nobody, nobody in the world, and not even anybody in our country, invests so much time and so many resources into developing leaders. We really are the, and I'm talking about civilians and military, and I don't think we do enough for civilians, by the way, on leader development. I don't control that. But I'll tell you, from the uniform perspective, we are the preeminent military leadership, uh, not military, we are the preeminent leadership experience in the world, period. And, and as long as we keep that, I think you'll be fine. We'll be fine. What else? Where? Oh, there you are. That was my Jeopardy theme song, in case you can't tell. Hey, while well, he's getting ready to ask the question, the last, you know, this Christmas, the last thing we're going to do is sing a Christmas, Christmas carol together. So be thinking about the words to White Christmas. I'll be back. Go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Duke Wade, I'm the Deputy Chief of the Fusion Center here at AFCOM. Uh, my question, you've spoken uh, quite lengthily today about uh, the fiscal cliff, about our uh, uh, fiscal concerns as we approach uh, this next year. And we've talked about uh, several other things. Uh, if you're familiar with what's commonly referred to among civilian parlance as the five-year rule regarding overseas uh, tour extensions with civilians, um, in the coming two years, uh, that will have a fairly significant impact uh, specifically on this command. Um, in light of uh, the cost to PCS and MOVE personnel, in light of, of this uh, growing fiscal concern, has there been any conversation uh, back within your circle laying that same kind of requirement on the um, U.S.-based COCOMs that would help facilitate a rotation because many of the individuals that sit in this room today are in positions that don't uh, lend themselves directly to going back to a station, a post, an airfield, or a garrison type of role. That Thank is you. a great question. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure I'll honor it with a great answer, but it's a great question. Now, I actually have a, a view of this because, I, you know, as you know, I've served in in uh, organizations overseas with, uh, uh, in some cases, with more civilians than military. I'm actually an advocate of the five-year rule, as long as there's an adequate number of waivers that the commander, be he military or civilian, can exercise. But I'm an advocate of it because I find that sometimes a new, a new set of eyes on old problems isn't a bad thing, actually. But to be fair about it, it does need to be more broadly applied so that Everybody's on, you know, uh, in the same competitive environment, if you will. I hadn't thought about expanding it, but I will. I can see, my, you know, Colonel Thomas over there taking taking notes. Here's, the, but there's some irony here that we'll have to work our way through. So, on the one hand, I think it's probably a good idea to look at applying the five-year-old kind of globally, really, so we get that new set of eyes on all problems in, may, in a competitive environment. But the budget pressures we're feeling are pushing us in exactly the opposite direction. So even on the military side, you'll hear the service chiefs talk about stabilizing. PCS costs, are, PCS costs a lot. So you're starting to hear the service chiefs talk about st you know, stabilizing, because, mostly so you can save the money for PCS rotations. But back to my question about adaptable. I, I actually think that I became an adaptable leader and our generation became adaptable because we were placed in so many different environments pretty frequently. I mean, every, certainly every three years, in some cases every two years. And, you know, right now we got young men and women at Fort Hood, Texas, don't even have to use a map or a, or a Blue Force tracker. You know, they just navigate in their training exercises using the, you know, the Hollywood call signs for the different terrain features. That's not good, really. You know, I, I, think that, I think that putting people in positions where they have to kind of reestablish their bona fides, where they have to learn, where they have to adapt, is really what's best for the institution. But make no mistake, the budget pressure is pushing, pushing us in the opposite direction. So we've got to find 
a way to balance that off. Yes? Is your button green? It's green. Okay. Yeah, there you go. General Dempsey said I'm not allowed to ask him a question because that would be considered fratricide. But, uh, uh, so I won't ask a question, but I'll make a, a statement. Could, uh, could I ask um, for our civilian employees, for all of, the, all of you who are not DOD employees, would you stand up, please? Helen, all right, others. Um, so, Chairman, I want, to, I want to show you this for two reasons. One, AFRICOM, thanks. AFRICOM has a small number of non-DOD participants, but we have more than any other combatant command in our headquarters. And they provide disproportionate value to the command uh, because they bring a set of skills and experience and background. Frankly, it's where we draw our African expertise of you know, former ambassadors like, uh, like uh, Chris Dell and Helen Malim uh, and, and many others. And I, and I bring that to your attention solely that as you're in interagency discussions and all these budget reductions occur, uh, we, ha we at AFRICOM, and I think we more broadly across the department, have a vested interest in the other departments and agencies keeping a resilience in their force that we can uh, uh, further expand our interaction in military commands. So, so thank you for that. Second thing is, uh, talking to our two senior Marines, Brigadiers General Chirodi and Omira, they said they can uh, solve the, the financial crisis. The Marines are ready, stand ready to take whatever pay reduction is necessary uh, for, the, for the good of the team. Mrs. Chirodi does not agree with that, right? but, uh, uh, but, I, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll be OK. Um, last, but let me just say to, to you, uh, uh, to Dean, uh, Sergeant Major and Lisa, thank you for, for making the trip to, uh, to come see us. It's a, it's a big deal when the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the senior, his senior enlisted advisor come. It's an even bigger deal when, when Mrs. Dempsey and Mrs. Battaglia come to visit. So we're very, very happy that you've, you've chosen to come spend a little bit of time with us. I would just tell you, you know, as, as you know, I have to tell you a little bit of a war story. So I had heard a lot about, about uh, Major Dempsey, Colonel Dempsey, but I'd never met him. I, I met Brigadier General Dempsey. Uh, he was in Baghdad. He was a serving division commander as a Brigadier General. Those of you who know in the Army, our division commanders are major generals. But the Congress that year decided to not confirm a promotion list, so you can't make him a major general. So he served as a Brigadier General and, and did so magnificently. Um, and, uh, and, and served with courage and commitment and did all the kinds of things that you would expect. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself uh, two things. First, I'm glad I'm not in Baghdad. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, so this is a guy who's got extraordinary talent, uh, but that wasn't as important as this is a guy who genuinely loves soldiers. Um, and, and I think as, a, as, as our leader, as our uh, senior uniform representative to the civilian leadership of our country, all of us soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, uh, civilian employees are very, very proud to have you, uh, the, the two of you, uh, as our voice, as our voices in Washington, D.C. and around the world uh, representing all of us. So thank you for, for what you do and thank you for the sacrifices that you make and I would just pledge to you that we at AFRICOM will do all we can to support you. I'll still pee on your leg over resources, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but we, we recognize that we're part of a larger enterprise and a big team, and I wouldn't want to be any, on anybody other's anyone else's team but yours. So thanks very much, Chairman. Very kind. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. I, you know, someone said to me, boy, it must really be awful to be the chairman right now. And, and my initial thought was, yeah, it really is. But, <laughs> but it's really not. You know, if you ever wanted to serve in uniform or in a suit for your nation when it mattered, it matters. And so uh, this is a great time to serve. It's a complicated time to serve, but it's a great time to serve. And I thank you all for doing it. Okay, here we go, because I want, we're going to have a little Bing Crosby moment here. This is Germany. The song was about a little fight in Germany, and Bing Crosby standing. I'm not, by the way, I'm not trying to convince you on Bing Crosby. 
But I am saying I'd like to have a little Bing Crosby moment with you. So we're going to sing White Christmas. And I notice I said we. That's the, the, the plural pronoun. And I'll, at some point, I'm going to listen, actually, to see if you're singing with me. And I will, I will call you out if you're not. So here we go. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas Just like the ones I used to know Somebody sounds good. Where the treetops glisten And children listen to hear Very good. One more verse. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas With every Christmas card I write May your days be merry and bright And may all your Christmases be white Merry Christmas! Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the all hands. As a reminder, the spouses participating in the round table, please come forward to the podium. And the rest of you, we would appreciate and assist after the chairman's departure from the facility. Thank you. You can exit front door. <laughs> <laughs>